So this lecture will be our last in our series in how different tax acquire and process nutrients. Next we'll be talking about how different tax are reproduced. But I want to pick up where I left off talking about chemoheterotrophs and specifically animals. And now instead of talking about sort of the standard nutrients that we think about things taking in to eat, we're going to talk about other important nutrients that animals and any other organism uh, that does uh, cellular respiration needs. And that would be gases. And specifically in animals, they need to get CO2 out. So remember that CO2 is a waste product of cellular respiration. So all of your cells got to get that CO2 waste product out of their cells because if it builds up too much, it can be toxic. And they got to get oxygen in. So remember that oxygen is an important reactant in cellular respiration. And so you need more and more oxygen to go in so that the mitochondria that are all inside of all of the cells in your body can produce ATP through this process of cellular respiration, okay? And getting CO2 out and O2 into all of your cells depends on diffusion from the environment. So you gotta get those gases out of the environment and into every single one of your cells. And then the CO2 and O2 has to diffuse across those cell membranes to get into and out of the cells. So O2 has got to get from the environment all the way into it, each cell and then move across the cell membrane into the cell and CO2 has got to do the opposite. And so some important things to think about in gas exchange are structure and function of course and this important sort of uh, structure that anything that's involved in CO2, O2 or gas exchanges, there needs to be very short distances across cell membranes for this gas exchange to occur. So for diffusion to occur, you need to have a very short distance between, let's say, like a capillary that's got blood flow with CO2 and oxygen in it and a cell membrane. There needs to be a very short distance between those two things um, or those two membranes. And there has to be lots and lots of surface area to volume or surface area in general for gas exchange to work. Now with that sort of structure of lots of surface area um, relative to volume, there's also, of course, a trade-off involved. So if you have a lot of surface area to volume ratio, um, you can lose a lot, a lot of water, okay? But you've also really got to keep these membranes and surfaces moist for gases to pass through them, okay? If any of those surfaces dry out completely, the cell membranes dry out, and then they're no longer permeable for gases to move in and out of them. So those membranes and surface areas have to stay moist, but at the same time, you've got to have a lot of surface area. Um, and when you have a lot of surface area, it's very easy to lose water. So that is a trade-off. Okay, so let's look at a sort of example of this. Lungs are a great example. So lungs are really important for pulling in gases out of the environment and exchanging gases with the environment. So if you're to look at a lung, you've got the sort of trachea leading into the lung, and then those lungs have lots of little branches that innervate through them called bronchi, and then a sort of sub-branch, a smaller branch is called a bronchiole, and then each of those bronchioles have these little sort of balls at the end that are called alveoli. And what this does is essentially it has a ton, a ton of surface area and wrapped all around those alveoli are capillaries. And so essentially what you're getting is a really high surface area to volume ratio to exchange gases with the blood. So if you were to zoom in on these alveoli like you're looking at here, you can see that there's very short distance for the transport of oxygen from the air into a blood vessel and a very short distance for the CO2 waste product that's in, in the blood to get out back across these membranes into the lung alveolus. So you have short distances and lots of surface area for exchanges of gases with the blood. And then on top of that, typically what we'll see is something like a circulatory system that's used to exchange gases with the cells. So this is getting gases into and out of the blood and then you have a circulatory system in turn that's sort of wrapped around the lungs and pumped by the heart that's going to pump oxygen to the cells. And so once again, you've got a lot of surface area. So these blood vessels, which will break down into even smaller capillaries, will have a single sort of cell membrane, you know, a single cell thick to connect with each individual cell for oxygen to diffuse across these cell membranes, once again, a very short distance into the cell and CO2 to get out. And then this will, of course, go back out to the lungs, back out to the environment, okay? So once again, high surface area to volume ratios for exchange and transport 
of gases, okay? Now in some animals, so for example, a flatworm, so this is an invertebrate animal, and this is called a flatworm because it's very, very flat. They actually have enough surface area to volume ratio that's exposed enough of their cells directly to the environment that they can do these gas exchanges without any circulatory system at all to have sort of bulk flow of gases through the organisms, okay? So once again, structure and function. Because they're so flat and thin, their entire body has a very high surface area to volume ratio. But the trade-off here is that these flatworms are limited to wet environments, so they need to keep these outside surfaces moist. If they were on land, they would dry out completely and gas exchange would not work, okay? So let's look at gas exchange in aquatic animals. So in aquatic animals, you can have animals with external gills and you can have animals with internal gills, okay? But in either case, they're using gills for gas exchange. So examples of animals with external gills would be something like a tube worm or something like a salamander. So this is obviously an invertebrate animal. This is a vertebrate animal. And in both cases, you can see these kind of feathery looking gills, okay? And so this is all about having a very high surface area to volume ratio for gas exchange. Um, in fish, you see once again, very feathery gills, but the gills are internal, so they're hidden um, sort of behind these gill slits. So in, if you were to open up and look inside that gill slit, you'd see these gill filaments, what are called filaments. So each of these little hairs that you're looking at here is a filament. And if you were to zoom in even further on one of these sort of filaments, you'd see that there are these things called lamellae. So these lamellae are a bunch of just sort of layers. And all this stuff um, and those lamellae will also are innervated with these capillaries. So you can see that there's blood flowing across them. And once again, this is carrying, creating a really, really high surface area to volume ratio and very, very short distances for gas exchange with the environment. In this case, gas exchange with water. Okay, so a couple sort of themes to draw from this. Once again, high surface area to volume ratio. So gills have filaments and lamellae to increase their surface area to volume ratio for gas exchange. And once again, there's examples of trade-offs here. So gills, like any other substance or sort of a, a membrane, has to remain moist for gases to be able to diffuse across them, okay? And so since water loss is less of an issue for aquatic animals, some aquatic animals can have external gills like we see in this tube worm or on these salamanders, whereas others can have internal gills. And typically, internal gills have evolved to help avoid damage. So having them internal protects them from getting all beat up. And that's important for animals like fish that are moving around really, really fast. Okay, so let's look at gas exchange in fish gills a little bit more closely to see how fish do this. So the way fish do it is essentially they'll open their mouth up and let water flow across these gills. So they open the mouth, the water goes in the mouth, and then it flows out through these gill slits. So when it's moving out across these gill slits, it's going to move across these gill filaments. And these gill filaments have veins and arteries running across them. So remember, veins have deoxygenated blood, arteries have oxygenated blood. So arteries will run out to the body to deliver that oxygen to all the cells. Veins will take the sort of waste products and CO2 out of the body. Okay, so if we look even closer at what's going on, we have this lamellae, we have it innervated with these capillaries, and then we have the blood flow that's the pore in oxygen that's flowing um, um, to the gills. So it's going to the gills to pick up oxygen, and then you have blood flow in the arteries that's flowing from the gills out to the body. And this is rich in oxygen, so it can deliver that rich in oxygen um, blood and that oxygen to the body, okay? And so oftentimes it's ha you have what's called this counter current where the blood flows against the direction of water. And basically what that does is it allows the blood to more efficiently pick up oxygen from the water and it'll pick that oxygen up and then send it out to the body. So that's called a counter current. So, a couple sort of important trends to pick up from this is that high surface area to volume ratio for gas exchange and the counter current where the blood runs in the opposite direction of the direction water is flowing to pick up oxygen as it heads out to the body and the cells helps the blood to absorb oxygen much more efficiently and way more efficiently than it would if the blood run in the same direction as the water does. Okay. 
Let's look at gas exchange in terrestrial animals now. So remember in terrestrial animals, we're talking about animals that live on land. The first we'll look at is grasshoppers and is an example of invertebrates and insects. In insects, um, they have what are called um, trachea. And trachea are essentially the animal equivalent to air ducts. So instead of having lungs in a circulatory system, they have this system of ducts called trachea. So they'll have a little opening um, in the side. So you can see these are little white things that you're looking at through here that look like a system of air ducts. These are all trachea. Um, and those trachea will get flexed by the muscles to allow the uh, grasshopper or whatever insect it is to breathe. That'll suck air, it'll sort of expand the trachea, suck air in through this spiracle, which is an opening. The air will move in. And then these trachea innervate so many different cells within the organism that they can essentially deliver air directly to almost all the places that need it. So this is a very different system than what we see or what we typically think of in terrestrial animals, which is of course a lung and circulatory system. And we talked about this lung system before, where in this case you have your trachea, which is just sort of tubes that go into the lungs and then they branch further down into bronchi, bronchi smaller bronchioles, and eventually alveoli that are all innervated with capillaries from the circulatory system. So this is blood wrapped around there for gas exchange, okay? And so a couple themes to pick up for both trachea and lung systems, okay, and the circulatory system that's involved in gas um, delivery is both lungs and trachea have a really, really high surface area to volume ratio, and they also have very, very thin walls that are just about like a cell thick to maximize rates of diffusion and transfer of gases, okay? So for example, humans have up to 500 million alveoli in their lungs. And if you were to sort of lay those all flat, that would cover an entire tennis court if you spread them out all flat. And so that's an entire tennis court with a surface area fitting inside of your body. That's a ton of surface area. Another important theme, of course, is trade-offs, okay? So membranes typically have to remain moist. Remember that. They have to remain moist for gas exchange. So terrestrial animals need to keep their lungs internal to keep them from drying out. So these lungs and these trachea, both these things have to be kept inside their body so because they have a really high surface area to volume ratio because otherwise they're going to dry out, okay? And these are just a couple important notes for you to review at home. I'm not going to review these in detail because I basically already said them, but I figured these notes might just help you when you're studying for the exam. Okay, so the last thing I'd like you to do as an at-home exercise is this idea of surface area to volume ratios and nutrient acquisition. This is a theme that we've had on over and over and over again. So please explain the following sentence using multiple examples across groups. Surface area to volume, Ratios for nutrient uptake is one of the most important factors in shaping organisms' morphology, okay? And so provide two examples that support that sentence for both plants, for plants, fungi, and animals. The last thing that I'd like you to do, um, or to remind you of, is that exam three is coming up. Um, so we've just talked about nutrient acquisition. If you go onto Canvas and look under modules, you'll see exam three. And there's uh, an exam three study guide that's posted there. Um, in addition, exam three, we're going to use uh, this lockdown browse and respond as monitor practice quiz. You can go ahead and start taking that practice quiz. It's not going to have like fancy questions that are going to prepare you for the exam, but it's going to make sure that your setup works.